<laughs> Hi everyone, Don Famular here. It's so great to be back here for VEDA. This is an incredible opportunity to have each week as we come on here. And just what you saw, John Fred Young, what a player. I mean, we're talking about some deep, deep commitment into every note he plays. It's 110% turned on when he starts playing. It's like a freaking runaway 18-wheeler that's going downhill with no brakes. Bring it on when he plays. It's absolutely exciting. And I want to share with you some of this great, great insight into John Fred Young. Is well known for his high energy, his deep groove, his dynamics, and his showmanship. His band, Blackstone Cherry, are a true band of brothers who have toured the world many times over the past 20 years, and they're still going at it stronger than ever. His family also has a deep, deep musical history as well, which we'll get into. So joining us live from Kentucky, please welcome John Fred Young. Yes. <laughs> what is going on, Dom? How you doing? John Fred, I get such a kick out of your playing. It's so deep and so powerful. Listen, you got to learn not to hold back or you're going to get an ulcer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely fantastic, man. Great, great fun and just so good. But, you know, you're coming to me from Kentucky here. So you grew up on a farm. Yes, sir, And there's some really great insight as to the real quality and, and morals and deep work ethic commitment that you have from being on a farm. So just go back to the early, the early days. What was it like growing up on a farm and, and then music seeping into your world? Well, I, I'll tell you what. First, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And obviously, thanks to Chad. Got to, got to say thanks to him for, for uh, inviting me to come on this amazing show. Um, I, you know, man, I grew up here in South Central Kentucky, and my dad and my uncle are two members of the Kentucky Headhunters, which yeah. Southern Rock, you know, you know, outlaw type country. Um, <laughs> yep, there they are. That's, that's them being their normal selves. <laughs> so we, uh, I, you know, just as a kid, I, I would go out with my dad and uncle on the road during the summertime. And I I don't ever think I, I knew any different because it was just my dad and uncle, you know, and I knew they played music. And, I, you know, I never really thought about playing drums or guitar until I was, you know, probably in middle school, you know, 13, 14 years old. But my uncle got me a, a little kit of drums. Uh, when I was probably about two and I used to just there, yep, there you go. <laughs> that is, it's so funny because my, my, I have three daughters and my middle daughter Sage looks exactly like I do right there. And I just realized that looking at it, you know, um, but I used to just, I used to beat the fire out of them. And, and you know, as time went on, I think, you know, my mom was kind of like, Hey, let's make some room in your room, you know, let's get these out of here, you know, so because I was driving her crazy. And uh, so, you know, gave them to Uncle Fred and he stored them. But as years went on, I got into music and I wanted to play drums. So I remember, this is so funny, uh, 
I got I got into really collecting antique pocket knives, like old case and like uh, fighting roosters and stuff. And like, you know, th those those like were I, I just I would go to, you know, shows and stuff like that, like knife shows. And I, I um, somehow collected like about 50 knives. So I wanted a drum set really, really bad. And so my uncle, I asked him, I said, hey, do you have a drum set that I could buy from you. And I'm about 13 years old in seventh grade. And he said, yeah, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sell you one. So I went up to the practice house, which is the old house that my dad and uncle and, and Greg and Anthony and, you know, all of them, but before the headhunters were ever, you know, the headhunters, they were a rock band called itchy brother. And so he let me go upstairs and, and look at some drums. And, and there was this, this, uh, Ludwig, I'll never forget. It's a Ludwig Black Wisher Pearl. It was probably like a like a sixties, you know. And I was like, man, this is this is the one right here. And he's like, I don't know about that one, you know. Let's let's get, you know. And I was like, no, Fred, I love that one. He's like, oh man, you know. So uh, so I, I sold all my pocket knives, and I got I got I think I got like maybe five hundred dollars together, and I took it to him, and before I could take it to him, he had the drums brought down like downstairs at Prax house and he cleaned them all up and stuff. And he, you know, he wouldn't take my money. So I was like, it was just, it was so great. And I, I still got that kid. It's up in my loft right here, but, um, yeah, I just, I, I started just playing and I, I would go down to the practice house, which we, we live in South central Kentucky in a, in a town called Edmonton and a lot of farmland. I mean, there's, you know, more cows and people and, I would go down there. My mom would drive me down to my dad and I just, I'd sit down at the practice house all day long playing these drums. I, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, and Fred kind of left me, you know, alone. Cause he was like, I don't want to intervene, you know? And, uh, he would come up and, and show me stuff and, and we would work on rudiments. And I remember when I was in seventh grade, I, I wanted to do a talent show at our school. And so I said, you know what, I'm going I'm to take those drums. I'm going to set them up on the stage and I'm going to do a, a drum solo. Well, thank goodness there's no recording of that because it was, it was <laughs> there's no telling what it sounded like. It was so much <laughs> and I, I remember when I got done, uh, I won third place. I mean, I was tickled to death. But my best friend, Chris, who sings in our band, is our singer, he, he come up to me after we got done and he said, man, he said, that was awesome. He said, listen, my dad's going to get me a guitar this summer. And he said, we need to, we need to put a band together. And I was like, huh? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, his, his dad, great, amazing guitar player. And uh, so he, he comes from a very, very uh, his long line of musicians. His grandfather was a, a mandolin maker, incredible mandolin maker and, and made acoustic guitars too. And, um, uh, so, you know, as kids, like Chris and I would go down, it's just he and I, and uh, we would go down to the practice house and, you know, my dad and uncle, I think they got really tickled because they were like, oh man, this is cool. You know, like, you know, they're teenagers and they want to play music, but we hung in there and we got some other buddies from school that wanted to play and, uh, you know, it was just the years went on and uh, it's like, man, we finally, that dad was just, it was at the point where dad was like, man, I think y'all are going to like do this, you know, is this really what y'all want to do? We're like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, uh, we played through high school and stuff. We would, we would play at the, the ball games, basketball games. And like, it was just really, it was cool. We had a lot of, a lot of friends that really dug what we were doing before, you know, before we ever had a record deal or anything like that, we'd have our buddies come down to the practice house and hang out. I mean, you got, you got a picture this, this thing is a old house in the middle of nowhere out in the middle of farm country. So we would stay there till one or two in the morning and just drag our butts to school the next day, be worn out, but we would be jamming all night long. So <laughs> I, that, that's kind of how things got started, you know, with, with me and playing drums and, and my dad and uncle, you know, helping us out, you know, and yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's well, it right there. With those uh, late jam sessions, how did you do in school? Uh, valedictorian. Right. <laughs> you, you know, what's funny is, uh, you know, we <laughs> I, I love history 
and I was I was I was I I, I excelled well in history and English, math not so much. But my my granddaddy was an amazing teacher in our county here, and he taught for like thirty I think it was thirty two or thirty three years, and he was a very artistic guy. He, he played piano, and my grandmother played piano too. So their home is right down the road from I. I my wife and I, we built our house right here on our farm and like the practice house is right down there. And then Nanny and Papa's house is right down there. And Uncle Fred is right up the hill. So I mean, like, it's a, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't move too far from, from this, but uh, no, I just, it, it was funny because I remember my, my grandfather was like, he was so proud of my dad and uncle with the accomplishments they did with the head hunters. And, you know, he was always, wanting my dad and uncle to go to college. And then when I, when we started playing music, listen, he was one of the most classy guys you'd ever meet, but he would turn around and have the greatest potty mouth you had ever met. You know? <laughs> so I remember when, when I, you know, got out of high school, we were, I mean, we were really, really working hard. We, every single day at the practice house, we were, you know, we were practicing. Like I said, we'd come in late to school. And uh, I think the teachers had all pretty much given up on us. They were like, they're going to be a rock band. So, you know, but I remember my grandfather said, now, listen, I know (laughs) he said, I know you want to play this music stuff like your dad and uncle. But he said, you need to go to college. And I said, "Okay, Pop. Yeah, I I know I'm going to do that. So I went a semester and I did really well. But we got a. we got some interest from a record label and I, I had to go uh, uh, tell him, Hey, look, I'm, I, I, I gotta do this music stuff. And he, he understood, you know, but, uh, and my grandma, you know, she, to be honest with my grandma was so into like the head hunters and she was so into our band. She had every single one of our shirts on hangers in her bedroom back there. So like, you know, my grandma was like, don't worry about it. Honey. She said, you just go rock and roll, you know? So, <laughs> I had, I had a, to be honest, you're talking about, you know, your values and, and where you come from that I, I, I truly am blessed. I am. I, I had the most wonderful, um, just, you know, family that supported us. And, and I think that's, I, I, every day I, I have to be grateful for that, you know, because my grandparents were so supportive. My, we would, you know what, Dom, we would practice until sometimes I'm not even joking two o'clock in the morning, three. And we would walk because we didn't have our driver's license. We would walk down the gravel road to my grandparents' house. And my grandma would be up at two o'clock in the morning making food. And because she knew we'd come down there and eat and they, they stayed up late too. So they were just super supportive. And, uh, you know, my, my dad, he, he produced our first record that we recorded back in 2005. So, you know, it's a, it's been a very big family um, you know, experience for, for us. And that, that's one of the, you know, there is right there. That's Richard. That's my dad. Yeah. Well, and, uh, that was cool, man. That picture is really cool. We, we took that in England and I, I'm, you know, my dad had this terrible fear of flying. He wouldn't get on a plane. And so I told him, I said, man, I got a buddy in England. So we, we started, let me back up. We started touring in England and over in Europe about 2007. Mm. And we went over with, with a bunch of buddies, an American band here in the States called Hinder. And they, they were doing great at radio and stuff. And they said, you guys want to go tour with us over there? We were like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was their first time over and our first time. So we, we got you know got a little airport shuttle van. And we followed them around and, and did shows and um, just kept you know building it, building it. But over the years, uh, we, we headlined a festival called Rambling Man. And uh, it's so funny. I had a buddy of mine over there who's a promoter uh, named Martin. He said, what's your dad and the headhunters doing? Do they tour over here any? And I said, man, I can't get my dad on an airplane. And he said, he said, well, he said, let's let's book a tour and we'll tell him after we book it. I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so so we, we got that picture of he and I is that uh, they played with us at, at a festival in England and it's so funny, like getting to getting to have your dad and, and uncle and the headhunters, you know, play on a on a festival that you're headlining in England. I, I, that's that's a very special moment for me. So I, that picture's at that show. 
Well, that is absolutely beautiful. You know, the, this family connection that you have is just an absolutely beautiful story because this really is a part of what all of life is about. When you have family and friends that close and you're you're living that close and you have that kind of relationship, it just adds so much more to the depth of the music. Yes, sir. The headhunters were playing. They were doing their thing. You were young hearing them, so they must have been influential to you as far as the kind of music that they were playing. That must have been seeping into your mind at that time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they, they have made so many great records, and... I, you know, I look back at like, you know, they, they started in the headhunters actually started in 88, I believe. And they released the first record in 89. And it was crazy, you know, because like in country music at the time, nobody was playing rock and roll. It was more standard type country stuff. Yeah. And so the headhunters were rock band. I mean, always they were huge Zeppelin fanatics, you know, the Who, Stones. And, you know, it's like they just like after a while, you know, they got with um, they there, there was two brothers, the Phelps brothers from Arkansas. And, you know, it's wild how the band came together. Uh, there was a, a there's a guy, Ronnie McDowell, who was a is a great you know singer. And uh, he was touring and. Uh, Doug, the the bass player for the Headhunters, he was playing bass, and Greg, who plays lead for the Headhunters, was playing guitar with Ronnie. And my dad was selling T-shirts, so that's how they kind of met. And and after Itchy Brother had kind of you know, kind of you know, uh, uh, stopped doing that that lineup, they put the Headhunters together, and you know they just they made some really great records, and it's just amazing. Like I I see. Uh, people on the road and, and obviously like all the bands that we tour with, you know, they, like, I remember when we first started touring, they'd come up and they'd be like, man, is your, <laughs> is your dad and uncle the headhunters, you know? And they, there's Fred at the, at the Grammys. They, they won uh, a Grammy in 1990 for best new group. I think, I think wow. that's what it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, they just made some killer albums. And I, I'll tell you, honestly, one, one of my favorite albums they ever made, um, was called That'll Work, and it was with Johnny Johnson, who obviously was, you know, was Chuck Berry's piano player, but yeah. really, I, you know, Chuck yeah. was in Johnny's band, right? But, yeah. uh, you know, I remember being a kid, and some, somehow my dad and the guys got hooked up with Johnny. I can't remember how, but they did a record together, and it is one of the best records. It came out on Electra in 1993, I believe. And man, I just remember being a kid and Johnny Johnson was down here at the practice house, you know, playing. I mean, he's, you know, just godfather of rock and roll, right? So, yeah. uh, but I, I remember my dad being like, you know, we, we could do, <laughs> we could stop touring right now. And if this was the last thing we did, this is the pinnacle, you know? And, uh, but I remember being a kid watching him play piano and I didn't, I didn't understand how, the, what the magnitude of, of who I was in the room with at that time, you know, being nine or 10 years old, but um, yeah, they've done a lot of really cool stuff, man. They, they've put out great albums and uh, you know, just, they, they still tour. I mean, they're, they're, they're still out there doing it. It really is incredible that, you know, having won the Grammy and, you know, 30 years later, they are still at the cusp of making it happen. That really is extremely inspiring. Yeah. So who, who were some of the drummers that you were listening to that were inspiring you, that were influencing your sound and your playing? Well, you know, when, <clears throat> obviously when I grew up, Fred was my, you know, number one and and always will be. Um, but, you know, it, it's wild because Fred has a super eclectic taste of music and, and drummers. So I remember as a kid, like he would, we would sit at the practice house and he would say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to work on rudiments. Right. And, but he would dig out CDs and play me stuff like just wild, random stuff, man. And I think one, obviously Zeppelin, like John Bonham, he introduced me to, you know, John Bonham and Led Zeppelin. And, um, I, I just, I mean, how can you not fall in love with John Bonham? That was yeah. like, you know, when I think, I think the first time I ever heard Zeppelin was at the practice house and, you know, I, I was like kind of blown away and, and Fred was, you know, trying to teach me how to play this stuff. And, um, 
so John, John Bonham's been one of my favorite drummers, you know. Um, and then Bernard Purdy, Fred was a massive Bernard Purdy fan. So, you know, he he told me he was like, "Look, man, we gotta." Okay, so this picture right here is really cool. Uh, this is at uh, John Bonham's grave in England, and I, I have a very dear friend of mine. His name's Connor, and he actually lives about five miles from from the church and and the the grave site. And I remember. You know, man, when I was in high school, Chris printed, our singer Chris printed me out a picture of his gravestone. I, I just, I was, I mean, I lived and breathed John Bonham every day, you know, trying to, trying to play those things he played and trying to, you know, uh, cop those things. And he printed me out a picture of that gravesite and I stuck it up in my room. And I said, man, I'm, you know, I, I'd love to go there someday and, and pay my respects to his, his, his grave site. And, um, I remember in 2000, that was 2013. And I, my buddy Connor said, uh, he said, Hey, he said, have you ever, uh, he knew, he knew how big a fan I was of, of Bonham. And he said, uh, have you ever been to his, his grave site? And I said, no, I said, you know, I, I know it's here somewhere. He said, yeah, it's about five miles from my house. Well, I started, I was like, Oh, you know? And, uh, so we go there his dad drove us uh down the road and it was really i, I got there and you know man it was emotional yeah. it was really emotional for me um i think just because like i grew up as a kid w like watching everything i could of him yeah anyway sorry yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah it just got it just cut music that's what music does it, it really you. It's powerful, and the fact that you get that emotional, I mean, which which many of us do regarding John Bonham. He left us way too soon and gave us some great music. And you mentioned John Bonham and Bernard Purdy, who were two of the favorite drummers of a dear friend of mine, Jeff Procaro. Oh, dude, that's on another level. And Jeff was highly influenced by Bonham and Bernard Purdy, and you can hear that sound even if, even in Jeff's own style, you can hear those influences of, of that sound. And I got to tell you something, you know, watching you play and hearing you play, you really have that bottom edge in your playing where every freaking note that you hit is committed 110%. That is so huge. Much. That, so that means the world. I, I really appreciate that, Dom. Thank you. Um, That's fantastic. I still don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I just hit them. So, <laughs> <laughs> you well, know Let's let's talk about that. When 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 you got together with with the, with Uncle Fred, you know he was showing you rudiments and showing you stuff. What was he teaching you? So paradiddle number one. He was like, well, I I remember even being a kid. He was like, okay, look, you gotta you gotta do right, left, right, right. And we would sit there, and I just I don't know. I, I it's my favorite rudiment of all time. I mean, yeah. and there's so many great ones, and you know, but you know, Fred he'll tell me stories, and he, he you know. Bless his heart. He is one of the best drummers in, uh, in, in my opinion, in the world. And, uh, but you know, he tells me, he's like, man, like I'll play something for him. Now we'll be hanging out up here at my house or something. I'll get the pad, you know? And he's like, uh, uh, I, oh, so, well, let me branch off really quick. So, uh, <laughs> Fred is like always on YouTube. He's always looking at like different, you know, drummers and he'll send me something. Hey, he's like, He's like, check this out, you know, and uh, YouTube has turned us into, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, hermits because all we want to do is sit and watch it. But uh, I, I, I know. Uh, OK, so I never met Gavin Harrison, but I, I, I want to. Uh, Fred is like become a big fan of his and the stuff he did. There's there's one. And I mean, everybody's probably seen it. It's, it's the, the Drumeo thing where he uh, he's doing. uh it's like he, I can't even remember what the what he calls this beat, but he's doing like it's it's just bizarre, and it's like you know, oh, hardest drum beat to learn in the world. And I remember Fred sent it to me. He goes, "Man, he goes, he's really country, even more than I am." He goes, "Man, what the heck's he doing on this?" And I said, "But I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I listen to it, and it's like it's crazy because his feet are doing sixteens, but he's playing the triplet, and then his hands are in five, if that makes sense. And it's like." It is bizarre. It's so 
like hard to separate and understand how he lays the accents and stuff. But I, I don't know. You guys might know what that video is, but man, that he is such a great drummer. But Fred and I, we we find these drummers and send them to each other now. Like I, I um, like I turned him on to Thomas Lang and uh, Thomas Pridgen, who I think those two guys are just you know insane players, great <laughs> great drummers. And um, you know, Fred, but growing up, like uh, Fred, you know, turn me on John Bonham, Ian Pace. Um, you know what? I'll tell you. Okay, so one of the drummers that I really I I liked a lot when I was growing up was Joe Morello, um, and we had the Hot Licks VHS tape. Fred yeah. had it, and we would we would play that thing and watch and like you know, dude, just I mean, on another planet, you know. You know, it's funny you mention that Joe Morello uh, was uh, one of my teachers that I studied with in the early 1970s. Joe lived in New Jersey. I live here on Long Island, so it was a not that far a drive to get there. And uh, I met Joe backstage at a Buddy Rich concert. And uh, I just, you know, was also one of those that were in awe of his playing. And to have the many years, about eight years of, uh, of going back and forth, taking lessons with Joe, it was an eye opener. And John Bonham's two favorite drummers were Buddy Rich and Joe Morello. Yeah. So when you think about the influence of what these guys have done, you know, Bonham was a great jazz drummer. And a lot sure. of people don't realize that. He played jazz fantastic. And that jazz influence, John was able to bring into his rock and blues style of playing. And Absolutely. it was just so great to, I think that's a part of the, the brilliance of John Bonham. He was able to pull from different styles of music and have such an open mind and bring it into his playing. But a guy like Morello, you know, pops up in all these different, uh, his, his name comes up all the time. So incredible. So this influence of drummers, you were bringing influences from all over the place. Yeah. And, and I, I have to thank Fred for that because, you know, obviously, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have grown up knowing any of those guys, you know, and so I owe a lot to him. Uh, but Fred was really influenced by Bonham, of course, but, and then Joe Murillo and, uh, man, like it, it, it's crazy watching like I, I watched something like a while back of um, it was oh this was really cool so Joe was on I think it was Conan and this was probably you know in the nineties uh, or maybe maybe even I don't know when it had to be early nineties or something but he's playing and he's just oh, it's just it's insane what he's doing but he loses a stick and he starts grabbing at his stick bag and he pulls out like a uh just like a bass drum like mallet you know and he's like what's i know what this <laughs> he keeps grabbing for stick the whole time he's just doing like stuff with one hand that nobody can do and, and i thought that's so neat and cool but man we, we would sit around like fred introduced me to, he, he made me watch buddy rich gene krupa max roach joe morello um just the greats you know and then i remember being a kid too and the headhunters did a really cool show called blues aid in helena arkansas and they i mean they obviously hugely influenced by the blues and i remember uh it was the headhunters and it was buddy miles mm. and i was like 12 or 13 and i got to watch buddy miles play and him and fred like like set up two drum sets and played and like it it was just bizarre and that you know he was a, a monster player so definitely I, li I liked all the stuff um, Buddy Miles did. And, uh, I'm just trying to think of so many others. Like, I mean, there's there's countless. Um, Fred Fred is a um, big Terry Bozio fan yeah. and Ian Pace fan. He turned, you know, I mean, he I, I just, I was so lucky to have Fred to turn me on to so many great drummers. And, uh, you know, it was, it was cool. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. So uh, I was like, I think I was, yeah, probably about 13 or 14. And I went to, um, with my dad to Nashville and it was the summer NAM show and I'm walking around and I'm, I'm looking like it's the first time I'd ever been, you know, to any kind of show like that with that many drums. I was just like geeking out, freaking, you know, I'm like, wow, these drums. But I remember, you know, being like, like a teenager, you know, you go and like, you know, you're looking at all the drums and like, you're wanting to play them all. And you know, all the companies are like, okay, move along. <laughs> You know, get out of here, kid. Well, I remember I walked by this this uh, group of people, and there was a, a, a gentleman playing a practice pad. And there was probably about 10 or 15 people watching this guy. And I was like, man, what? Like, this is 
awesome what he's doing, you know? And so I sit there and then people started moving in and out and I kind of like whizzed up in there, you know? And I remember I was, I, I, I knew, I knew this guy was like outer space good. So I was like, I'm just going to watch him. And he was playing and he had a stick and he said, now, and there was a, a guy in front of me. He said, now I, I, I'm going to play and I want you to take that stick out of my hand. See how light I'm holding it. And I thought it was so bizarre. This guy grabbed the stick out of, out of this gentleman's hand. He was playing it. And, you know, he was, he was expressing to have a loose grip mm-hmm. and not to choke the sticks. And uh, it, it, it was like one of the, I, I didn't know at the time how important this would be, but the gentleman worked with me on how to hold sticks and how to get this motion that did this. And I was like, you know, I, I was like, man, this is, I, this guy really, and he did, he sat there for like 30 minutes with me. And and there's probably four of us left by the time I said bye to him. Such a nice guy. But um, that was Jim Chapin. <laughs> right. And I remember going back to my uncle when I got home from Nashville. I said, man, I, I really, I, you know, got to like meet this guy. And he's like, what was his name? And I told him, he's like, you what? <laughs> freaking out you know and i was like yeah yeah show me how to do this thing called molar <laughs> <laughs> and so fred was just like you have no clue you, you know and uh but no i i so i i obviously took that with me too and like i try you know it's it's kind of a thing man like i i i'm so glad i i got to spend the short amount of time i did with him and and figure out you know he, he and what was so kind is he took the time a little kid, you know, and he took the time to to work with me and, and so many other people around there. And, and I I really I've always remembered that moment. Jim was a, a special person. He lived here on Long Island and I knew Jim. And also Jim was one of my teachers for many, many years. And uh, Jim was just as he was the last living student of Sanford Moeller. So he really understood this movement of how Moeller talked about this this whipping motion and that relaxed movement was one of Jim's things that he always taught all the times in the lessons he would ask me to pull the stick out of his hand and I never had a challenge it came out of his hand no matter how fast or how powerful he was playing that stick came out so the fact that you were exposed to that is absolutely incredible but now bring me bring me up to about 2001 you're in your teens and you start with the band Blackstone Cherry you meet some friends and here you are now yep. forming your own band how did yeah, that begin yeah. So, you know, we, we all went to high school with each other and Chris, Chris and I, our singer actually went to kindergarten with each other. So we've known, we've known each other, you know, Chris is on the very far right there and that's Ben in the middle. Ben lived in the next County over from us in Barron County. And, you know, it was just like, man, instant brothers. As soon as we put the band together at the practice house, we, we had some buddies, we had a, a, a party one night, you know, and uh, a bunch of people from, you know, different schools came down and Ben came down. And uh, the next day we, we put the band together. You know, we, we had, we were having a jam part, you know, session. And a lot of people were playing. And um, I remember Chris, uh, it was his 16th birthday. It was June 4th, 2001. And so we went to the practice house and we all just started jamming. And that day we put the band together. And... I remember we didn't have a band name. So Ben was spending the night with me at my parents' house. You know, you think we're like, you know, maybe 15, 16 years old. And uh, we had snuck and got some cigars from somebody. And they were they were Blackstone cigars. And we were, you know, hiding and, and being cool. And uh, so we're like, what, what are we going to name our band, you know? And we were just, uh, the, you know, the names were, you know, <laughs> monumentally horrible but <laughs> he's like hey what what if we called it like like black stone but the, the cigars were cherry flavored he said what if we put all that together black stone cherry i was like man that's it dude you know it's going to look good in lights <laughs> so um we we uh we, oh yeah man from that that day right there it was it was uh all of us man and, and we've been together 20 years this year it's 20th anniversary of the band so absolutely fantastic. So we, you, you guys started writing tunes. How was the writing happening? How did that, and what was some of the goals you're writing? 
did you have plans of what you wanted to do with the band or were you just having fun? You know, I, I think with us, it's so wild because we didn't want to do anything else besides play music. And from day one, we started writing original music. I remember we wrote a song that day and that song later got on one of our, our later albums. Um, but it's just, uh, I think it, you know, it was, it was so strange for four kids from Kentucky, very, you know, just small town. And like to, to have like lightning strike twice, the headhunters and then us. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we, we wanted to do anything else. We just wanted to play music. And I remember we would go do shows anywhere we could. We would like, we were playing like the, the country line dance places. We, we would, we would ask uh, if we could, you know, do a rock and roll night on Friday nights. And that was like, that was taboo. You know, they were like, I don't know guys, you know, <laughs> we do, we do boots, cook boogie over here on the weekends. You know, we're like, oh, listen, Friday night, just give us one night, you know? So we, there's this big place called the factory in KC, Kentucky. And we, we would go over there and on Fridays. We would have like local bands from the area would all play and stuff. So we started getting a little following around here. And I think my dad, there was a point in time where my dad was like, okay, you guys are actually going to do this series, right? So he started, you know, managing us and, and helping us put shows together. And we would go play, you know, bike rallies. We, we'd go play, like, we played our Mexican restaurant here in town. Our, our great friends let us, like, play in the middle, you know, one night. and uh, Just anywhere, anywhere we could. And, and we would, we played with so many bands in the early years, like 2002, 3, 4, we were playing with Ted Nugent, Grand Funk Railroad, Anthrax, the Headhunters, anybody just random. You know, we would take a show with anybody just to get out and get get exposure. And um, I remember in 2005, uh, 2004, we, we met a guy from a label. And he uh, he really liked us. And he, he thought that, you know, there was something there. And so here my dad started working together. And um, I got I to gotta thank our, our great friends in, in Shinedown because uh, we just did a show with them the other night. Love, love those guys. They uh, actually helped. It was their label they were on. It was their radio rep who found out about us, and they gave him a CD. And so he got in touch with us, and, and uh, him and my dad worked for probably two years. And we finally got to New York and did the big showcase, you know, and, it was like, man, they, they were just like, no, no, no. So we were like, okay, back to the drawing board. So we came, we came back to Frax House, and uh, uh, but we hung in there, man. We met, we you know, finally got a deal uh, in 2005. We went back to New York, and uh, we we signed with uh, Roadrunner Records back in 2005, and uh, you know, we put out some great records on on that label, and then in 2014, uh, we um, we were. We were free agents in the world. Yeah, that. So this right here, that's our, our debut record that came out mm -hmm. in two thousand six, and um, so I think there was four. Let me try to think here. Five, four or five records on that label. That that's uh, the second record, Folklore and Superstition. That came out two thousand eight, and um, worked with a really great guy, Bob Marlette, on that record, and. Yeah, it's just it's crazy. Now we're on a, a label called Mascot out of Holland, and we're we're three albums deep. And our, our latest record is called The Human Condition, and it just came out last October. So, so how yeah. how how prolific is the writing? In other words, who who does the writing in the band? Is that a collaborative thing? Do, do do individuals bring in songs? How do you because I mean, you went from a a young jam band in a farmhouse yeah. to being signed? I mean, this is really incredible. It, it is it is amazing and it, and it's it's uh you know I, I think as far as the writing so my dad is a really great songwriter and I remember day one of us being in the practice house you know when we were writing original stuff um, he said you know he, he explained to us how important uh, how important writing was and how you know we needed to hone our craft and really you know make this the the, the ultimate goal because he said you know you know, you, you, you obviously got to have a great live show. You got to be entertaining. But he said, at the end of the day, it's about the song, you yeah. know, and, and you, you all can be great musicians. You, you strive for that. But he said, you know, 
you definitely got to put that emphasis and hard work into becoming songwriters. So, so we all wrote the songs together. Uh, the music, the lyrics, the ideas, like somebody would bring in like a guitar riff and then we would go from there. You know, one of us might have a melody, you know, uh, pecking out something on the piano. It, it, it was very random, but we, we worked as a, as a unit, you know, and, and that's how we do it today. You know, um, of course, back then we weren't touring, so we would get together at the practice house and just write for hours and hours. And my dad would come and help us how to, how to structure, you know, verses into courses and, uh, you know, it just, I mean, we were blessed, really, really blessed because he helped us understand the transitions, you know? Right. So how did you work the business side now? You guys all were equal partners in this and were yep. you, all, you were all were sharing in the publishing of the tunes into themselves too? Yep. hundred percent. My dad told us, he was like, look, he's like, you got to do everything equal. He's like, you're a band, you're a unit, you're brothers. He said, this is, this is why it's so important. And, and I, I like when younger bands, you know, anybody that comes to our shows and they're, you know, enjoying what we do and they're trying to also play music. You know, we always tell them it's, it's important to be just in a band with pe people you love. First of all, I mean, you got, you got to love the people you're playing music with because it's a family. And um, so, yeah. So, so the business side of things, my dad was hugely instrumental because he had had this legacy with the headhunters and he knew pitfalls and he knew what to do. And, and you know, the, and obviously the industry is changing all the time. Of course, now we're in the digital age, but uh, you know, yeah, we, oh, we were so lucky because he taught us about publishing, taught us about songwriting, how those things work and how the splits are. Um, but yes, yes, it's very, and I would tell any, you know, artist band out there is, is to, you know, play in a band that, that, you know, first of all, you got to love the music you're doing. But you got to love the people and then create something that's, that you feel proud of because, you know, and, and, and you know, I grew up wanting to, you know, be Uncle Fred or be John Bonham. But, you know, you find, you find um, after, I think, what you're interested in, you musically and what you're, what you're drawn to, those are your influences. But then after years and years, you, you do mold into what it is you do. And, and to be honest, I, I think I, I never... I've never ever looked in, at like my playing personally and um, defined it as what it is. Cause I don't know what it is. Cause it's just a big melting pot of, of guys that were <laughs> light years ahead of me. And I just took it all and, and took little bits and pieces and, and I, I, I do what I do back there. And as a songwriter too, I, you know, obviously, I mean, you, you pull from all the greats, right. You know I mean? And I, I think that our brand of music, I think strikes a chord with people and they like it because it's, it's, it's genuine. And, it, but it also, it, it has very, uh, it's reminiscent of, of, you know, the Zeppelin stuff and Skinner and Aerosmith and ZZ top and, and the classic, the classic iconic rock stuff. Yeah. Then also there's the blues influence, you know, the, the muddy and Howlin' Wolf and Lightning Hopkins and, and stuff like that, that, uh, you know, we got introduced to from the headhunters and then there's some, you know, all the Motown stuff, you know, I mean, like one of my favorite, I, I got to see, uh, I was really lucky, man. I got to see Percy Sledge sing in Bowling Green, Kentucky with my, my wife back in 2008. And you know, he's doing like when a man loves a woman, I'm just sitting there like my head down, you know, like, I mean, there's probably a hundred people out there watching him. I'm just like mind blown. But I, 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 I love like Sam Cooke and, um, Percy and Otis Redding, I used to drive around in my little SUV, man. And I put like that Otis CD in and Percy Sledge and like Sam Cooke. And, and as a, uh, a singer, I'm not a great one, but those are, those are my, you know, guys like well, that. For It's kind of interesting because, you know, it sounds like you got some serious muscle shoals influence from, from that whole world of that, you know, Southern rock and what they did with the blues and that, that mixture of what it was, but you mentioned singing. Listen, you do some singing. How you know? How is that learning how to sing and you know working on that? That's a whole nother level of of adding to the complication of playing drums. What was that? What's that like? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. When we first started touring, uh, I was uh, you know all of us in the band sang you know backup, 
and and we did harmonies. And Chris had when we first put the band together, Chris had the most unique voice out of all of us. I mean, it was just this, it was just power, you know, and he had this, the, what, what, oh, hang on, this is pretty funny. So Chris has this really unique and very, very, um, um, individual thumbprint of vibrato. And, and it, it, we kind of like, after years and years, we've kind of come to this conclusion of why he has it. Uh, when we were kids, we had, we had an old Wurlitzer at the practice house. And it was, it was the one Johnny Johnson played on the Headhunters records. But my dad would work with us on singing, you know, you know don't sing sharp and flat, you know. Well, you know the old Peterson strobe tuners yeah. that, you know, guitar, okay, well, <laughs> my dad would, would hook up a microphone into that tuner and we would set it on the Wurlitzer and we would all get around it and like sing scales and stuff, you know. Well, my dad worked with Chris so much with this Wurlitzer. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but the vibrato was turned up all wide open on it. So Chris would hit a note and he would sing in it and he would see where that strobe tuner was, you know, reacting and holding, you know, pitch. But we think he was mimicking the Wurlitzer with the vibrato, you know, after so many years working with it. And we're like, man, listen, if we had turned that vibrato off, you know, maybe he wouldn't have the vibe. <laughs> Isn't that wild, though? But that is, that's fantastic. So, talk about you know in, in the writing process. Are you guys, you know, are, are you jamming together do you, when you go to the studio? What's the recording process when you get there? Do you do you pretty much know what you're going to do? Does the band play together? Do you go in there individually? What's that process like? So, in, in the early years, we we uh, recorded um, here in town in in Glasgow uh, where Ben lives. It, there's a, a, there's a great guy, David Barrett, great friend of ours, who we did the first record at his studio. And, you know, a first record. I mean, now let me take a step back. In high school, the very first recording we ever did is on a record called Rock and Roll Tape. And it had a piece of duct tape across the label and it had you know, Rock and Roll and Sharpie. So we did that with David. I sold that around school and stuff. And, yeah, you couldn't even get anybody to buy it for 10 bucks. And... Now it's on eBay. And it's like <laughs> you can't afford it. I can't afford to buy one. But but the the first record, the debut record we did in, in 2006, we did with David at his studio. And I remember um, we all recorded live in in the room. So it was drums, bass, guitar, guitar. And uh, what we would do is we would get the best performance we possibly could, and then if if we need to go back and retrack you know, like a guitar part or punch in a drum fill. Um, that's, that's kind of how our method was for years. And, and we did that on folklore and um, between the devil and the deep blue sea. And also uh, magic mountain, I'm pretty sure. Um, so on this, but I'll tell you on this last record, uh, the human condition, we did a total different approach to how we recorded. And, I was kind of like, you know, nervous about it at first. And I, I got to say, we, we met a, a really great friend of ours. Um, his name's Jordan Westfall, and he is a world-class engineer, a great, great guy. Great. He, he, uh, we met him with, uh, some really good buddies of ours, um, Shaman's Harvest and, uh, rock band. And, um, the, he, he came out to do some monitors for us. And, and he was, um, he was, you know, playing some stuff in the back lounge and we were like, man, what are you listening to? And he's like, oh, I'm mixing this for this this band back in Kansas City. And we're like, well, let's, let's hear it, man, you know? So it was, it was, I think it was like a metal record he was doing. And we were just blown away. We were like, man, you, you know, you recorded this and engineered it, mixed it? And he said, yeah, yeah. We were like, all right, okay, cool. Well, so when we, when we came, it came time to do this last record, we asked Jordan if he would, uh, you know, be our engineer and uh it was it was cool man because he, he brought a lot of um like a lot just a lot of his thoughts and ideas on how to get sounds and uh he's just world class man the the wild thing is is that uh we actually recorded for the first time one guitar track as a scratch and then another guitar and bass and Chris would do a scratch vocal, I would go in 
on this record and do the drums last. So I was, and that's, that's, uh, that's the green, uh, DW kit. It's a maple kit. And actually what's crazy, that kit right there is what I'm touring with live, but that's not the kit we recorded on the record. We actually, I called Garrison at DW and I said, Hey man, I said, we're, we're going to do things a little different on this record. And I like to have a kit that is really unique and doesn't sound like any, you know, it's just, it doesn't have to be like from outer space, but something that's a little bit different than my, my maple kits. And he's like, you, you want something like loud? And I'm like, yeah, man. He said, man, I got this oak kit, solid oak kit. He said, it weighs a ton. He said, it's the, it's the prototype. But when we first started making these you know kits, we had to make one and test it out. And he sent me a picture of it. And I said, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I use now. I will say it's a 23-inch bass drum. So it's a 23 by 16 deep. Mm -hmm. It's a, and this is what we use on the record. Um, it is a 14, no, excuse me, I'm sorry. 13, 16, 18 Tom. And I used a bunch of different wild snare drums. I got some snare drums back here I used on the record. Um, but I was just trying to get a drum sound that was really unique. Mm -hmm. And I think... I'm just trying to see what if anything's back here. I've got like, you know, I, I obviously love the DW stuff. I've been with them for 12 years and I've collected antique stuff and I yeah, got, got like the Fred blood, you know what I mean? So, uh, but that record was wild because we first time we'd ever recorded drums last. And I, and to be honest with you, like when Jordan mentioned it, I was like, man, I, I'm kind of like freaked out about that. Cause we've always done the live take and then we go back and fix guitars and, and fix drum tapes and, but he was like, well, he's like, Let, let's try it and see how you like it. And, and what I found out is really cool when, from, and this, is, this helped me out a lot too, is when I'm doing the drums last, everybody is sitting in the control room and they're really listening to every single thing I'm doing. And I think when we're playing live, when we're cutting you know, live tracks, everybody's in their own world playing an instrument. And I, I really value everybody's thoughts and, and, you know, ideas when it comes to the drum parts. Like, you know, Chris won't tell you, but he's a really good drummer too, or singer. And, you know, he'll come up with different, you know, ideas and beats and Ben will too. And so it, it's a team, man. Like there's parts on Chris's like lead solos, you know, I'm like, Hey Chris, man, I'm like I'll hum a melody and he'll, he'll like, all right, let me work that in there. So we, we just work back and forth with each other on stuff. And it's a team, you know, it's beautiful. Well, it's amazing. The sound you guys get both in the studio and live is just so unique. And again, so powerful. It's like a wall of sound, but I know in your hands, you've got the Vader 55 double a, how yes, do you like sir. that model stick in your hands? Cause it works for you. Right. I, I'll tell you what. So I, I love the 55. AA. And, and I'll tell you why. So when I was a kid, Fred played um, just standard 5A. And, and I remember, you know, growing up, man, you know, he would give me sticks and stuff and uh, I would, I'd play with him. But I always felt like, <laughs> look at that guy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I when, when I when I called Chad back in 2011, I said, hey, man, I'm, you know, I'm John Fred. I play in a band, you know, and um, I was like, man, I, I really go through sticks a lot, you know, and, and, uh, I, I, you know, obviously hit hard and stuff. And I said, I, I got some mural stuff, uh, from, from another buddy we were touring with. And I, I just, man, I love them, man. They're, they, they feel just the quality of the sticks and how just, I was just impressed of how they held up, you know? And, uh, so he, he put me in touch with Chad and, Man, it was just no looking back. I mean, I and, I and I went through so many different models. There was a Warrior that I used. There was the the XD five A, which is longer, and everything has been great, you know. But right now, I'm on I'm on the five five A's, and, and I love them. Uh, it's kind of a, I mean, it's not like an acorn tip, but it, it kind of is in a way. It's it's more of an acorn, I suppose. But you know, the diameter is great because it's it's bigger than a in diameter it's bigger than a 5a but i don't feel like it's so thick as a 5b right so um yeah they've been great to me man i i tell you i uh uh so lucky to be with the vader family and i you know they treat me 
just great, you know. And I and I wear Chad out constantly. I've, I've been, like I swear I went through. Chad could probably give you give you the correct amount. I, I ordered like two cases, like twelve bricks, and I went through them. I think in like three weeks, and you know he's just like, oh yeah, just cut down, cut down more trees for you. <laughs> well, listen, but hold up. Don't be surprised if we don't travel over to the farm and borrow a couple of trees you have on the farm. So that might be the next step. <laughs> we might have to start doing that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, you know John, it's, it's John Fred, man. You, you are an energized person. You've got some great, great stories. You've got a great history of this band that's going on. You've got an incredible story of, you know, history from not only the, the farm history and in, in growing up on a farm with those great, great values to, of course, having your dad and your uncle to be there and influencing you and you carry on the tradition of the music in your family and you're inspiring hundreds of thousands of people, you know, through your music and through your live tours. So I want the band to get back on the road and get back in action sooner than later, for sure. Thank you so much, Dom. I, I really appreciate that. And, and it's, I tell you, it's an honor to, to be able to talk with you today. I, uh, I hope that you know, in, in the future that we can meet in person and hang out and you can teach me some stuff. Cause I'm telling you, I, you know, you Any are a time, master man. man. Come by. We'll get you in the studio here. We'll have some fun for sure. And I look forward when the band, if the band at all gets into the New York area, you make sure you give me a goal and track me down. I want no. you to be safe. Send my best to your dad and your uncle, your entire family. Stay well, keep the band going sure. strong. You're really making a difference. And this is fantastic. Stay well, stay healthy on behalf of the Vader company. We thank you so much. Keep going. John Fred Young, you're fantastic. You too, Dom. Thank you. God bless you. Take care of yourself, okay? Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> See you, buddy. Till next time. For sure. But what a great guy. I mean, the stories are endless, as you can hear. We've had people that have come on here from, my gosh, Claude Hoffman from, from Belgium, Rene uh, Barthen from the Netherlands. We've got people from all around the the, the, the country here, and this, this is just so incredible. This, this band has such an incredible influence. We've got, uh, we even had uh, Jose Gonzalez from, you, listen, Fort Knox, Kentucky. You're right there. You got to, at some point, Jose, get together with John Fred and hang out. You guys are close together, man. Absolutely great, great stuff. You all have been great. The Vader Company, thank you so much. Hang out. Next week, we'll do it again, and we'll have some more fun. On behalf of Alan Vader and Chad Brandolini from the Vader Company, we thank you all very much for joining us. Stay well. I'm Don Familaro. We'll see you real soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.